So uh, it's going to be a great weekend next weekend as well. But uh, this weekend, what I want to do is I want to look at fighting for an awesome marriage. We're kicking off a new series uh, today called Awesome, Fighting for Great Relationships. And um, so fighting for an awesome marriage. And Paul says this, and remember, Paul wasn't married. Paul was a single adult, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 7, we are all given different gifts, he says. God gives the gift of marriage to some, and to others that he gives the gift of singleness. Now, how do you know if you have the gift of singleness? People ask this sometimes. Well, if you have any desire to ever get married someday, then in all likelihood, you don't have this gift, okay? The gift of singleness, when God gives it, means that, you know what? I'm perfectly happy to live the rest of my life not married. That's the gift of singleness. Now, whether you've never been married or you've been divorced or you're separated or you're widowed or you're currently married, regardless of what state you're in, this next verse applies, <coughs> excuse me, applies to all of us. And it's Hebrews 13, verse 4. It says, marriage should be honored by who? Everyone, not some, everyone. Marriage should be honored by everyone. I would circle that word, everyone. So regardless of whether I ever marry or not, whether I've ever been married in the past, and maybe I'm not now, I am to honor marriage. God says, through his word, everyone is to give honor to marriage. The sad thing is, marriage is no longer honored by everyone, right, in our society. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Today, marriage is dismissed as irrelevant by many people, as archaic. They say, who needs to get married in today's day and age? That's something for another generation or another culture, or, or it's a man-made lifestyle choice. So marriage is dismissed, and it's demeaned by many people. It's a career buster. People say, oh, you're getting married? There goes your career, right? And, and you've heard people say these things before. So marriage is delayed. The average age for marriage in, in this country right now it, for women is 27 and for men is 29. That's a far cry from when my parents and your parents uh, probably were getting married. My parents got married and my dad was 20 and my mom was 17, soon to be 18, a couple months later. But she, was a, she, she had graduated high school. People always ask that next question. 20 and 17. So 27 and 29 is, is, a, is a big difference. People are delaying marriage more and more, many times for the wrong reasons, for selfish reasons. There are good reasons for delaying marriage, but there are also lots of selfish reasons, and marriage is being redefined in our country and in the world around us. It's being ridiculed and demeaned and discouraged and disrespected. We don't live in a culture anymore where marriage is honored by everyone like that verse talked about. And even Christians... People who call themselves Christians and, and, and show up in church every Sunday and read their Bible, even Christians fall for this trap. Part of the problem is, is that nobody knows the basics anymore. Uh, Fifty years ago, if we were to go out on the street and say, say to the people walking up and down the street, tell me the purpose of marriage, they could give you five or six different purposes for marriage, five or six different legitimate reasons why people should be married. But nobody knows these today. They, they can't even hardly talk. You could do like Jay Leno used to do, and, and he did that segment called Jaywalking, you know, where he'd go out and ask people questions. People couldn't answer the question, why should you get married? Why, why should you marry instead of living together? So marriage is treated just more like a lifestyle choice these days, but it's not. It's far more important than you realize, and it's absolutely essential. Most people don't know why marriage matters. The reality is marriage won't solve all of your problems. Everybody said? Actually, I'll correct that, though. Marriage won't solve any of your problems. Okay? Not only will it not solve all your problems, it won't solve any of your problems. <laughs> Somebody knows. Listen, a lot of people think that marriage creates problems. They say, well, I didn't have any problems until I got married. No, that's wrong, too. Marriage doesn't, marriage doesn't solve problems. Marriage doesn't create your problems. What marriage does is marriage reveals your problems. If I'm cranky, my marriage is going to reveal it because there's somebody else who's seen that. If I'm a perfectionist, my marriage is going to reveal it. If I am fearful or insecure or if I'm bitter or angry or controlling and manipulative, my marriage is going to reveal those things. Marriages don't create problems. Marriages reveal them. They just show up in marriages like no other relationship because we're with that person so often. You know what the problem with my marriage is? Me. You know what the problem with your marriage is? You. 
It's, it's our problem. We bring our problems into our marriages. Marriage simply magnifies what already, it, what's, what's already a problem that maybe was masked when I was living as a single adult. I could suppress that. I could hide that. But when you get with somebody and you're with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, those problems are revealed. They become clear to the person that we're with. So marriage won't solve all your problems. Marriage won't turn your life into a picnic. There are a lot of things that marriage can't do, but it does have a God-designed function. It does have a God-designed form, and it's far more important. Marriage is far more important than you realize. So today, what I want to do today is, just for a few minutes, I want to give you six reasons why marriage matters. Six reasons why marriage matters, and it's really quiet in here today. So uh, <laughs> the lights feel hotter, and you know, so. I know, touchy subject in the culture that we live in, right? But I'm going to give you six reasons, biblically, why marriage matters. And as I wrote this, I discovered that I had way more material than I could cover in the time that I have on Sunday morning. So we're not going to get to everything on your outline today. We're going to finish it next week. And actually, my wife is going to join me up here on stage for a little bit of that as well. So we're going to wrap this up next week uh, and talk about the seasons of your life in marriage. Um, but today, six reasons why marriage matters. Why did God design marriage? Why did he create it? First, God created it for the connection of men and women. God created marriage for the connection of men and women. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 11. It says, in God's plan... Men and women need each other. Do you know how radical that statement is in today's culture? A lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people say, women don't need men. Why would I need a man, right? Some of you who've been married a while, you're like, yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. A lot of men say, why would I need a woman? Well, because the God who designed you the God who created you, whether you ever get married or not, God wired it this way. That's what that verse says. God thought up gender. God thought up sex. Amen? And, and, and God, see, there was that word. I told you it was coming. And God thought up marriage. He thought up all of it. It was his idea. It wasn't some man-made construct like the world tries to tell you. The Bible goes back to the very beginning, the creation of the first couple, the very first marriage in Genesis 2. The Bible says God creates Adam, but then he doesn't make Eve for a little while. Why did God make Adam and wait a little while to make Eve? Why didn't he make them both at the same time? Well, God obviously had a reason for this. And I think that he did that for Adam's benefit. I think he wanted Adam to realize how much he needed a woman in his life. Companionship that partner in his life. You know, if he created them bo at both at the same time, Adam probably wouldn't have had the same, same gratitude for that companionship. He wouldn't have had the, the understanding that there's, there's a benefit to having a helpmate in his life. And so God wanted Adam to realize how much he needed Eve in his life. The Bible says this in Genesis 2, 18. It is not good, that's God talking there, it is not good for the man, that's Adam, to be alone. I will make a com companion who is right for him. God says, I'm going to make a companion who's perfect for Adam, who's right for him. Notice the first thing that you need to realize that marriage and gender, is that gen marriage and gender and sex, men and women, all these differences, this is a God-given thing. And one of the purposes of marriage is, is to... It's an antidote to loneliness. Marriage is an antidote to loneliness. Look at the next verse. He says there, it is not good for man to be alone. Then he says, I'm going to make a companion. Many companions are important in life. We all have other types of companions. You need companions in all different areas of your life. But there is nothing like the companionship of marriage. It's in a relational class by itself. Here's what Jesus had to say about it in Mark chapter 10. God's plan has been seen from the beginning of creation when he made us male and female. God made males, God made females, and God chose what he wanted you to be before you were ever born. And it goes on to say, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united as one body. Now since they are no longer two but one, so God sees a married couple as one, right? No one should separate them, for God has joined them together. This is a very, very important passage of Scripture. And I could spend a lot of time on that. I could do a whole other sermon on that. But let me just make three points out of this passage real quick that, that this passage says. One, marriage is God's plan. 
It's not a human plan like the world tries to tell you. It's not a human idea. It's not some tradition that we can just throw out. God invented marriage and he, when he invented you and when he invented me. When he invented humanity, he had marriage in place. Marriage is God's plan. The second thing that this verse says is that marriage is between a man and a woman. There are a lot of other relationships out there, but those are not marriage. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Their body parts fit together, and they fit together for a purpose, the creation of everyone else. It says what God joins together, God joins a couple in marriage, no one else should separate that. It's meant to be permanent. It's meant to be for, for life. You realize, I know you realize how radical those statements are this morning because it's quiet in here this morning. Marriage is God's idea and his plan. Marriage is for a man and a woman, and that marriage should be permanent. Listen, fewer and fewer believe that anymore, but it is still the truth. It doesn't matter if fewer people believe that or not. God's word is the truth yesterday, today, and forever. It's still the way that God designed marriage. And just because we live in the real, not necessarily the ideal, doesn't mean that we get to say the ideal doesn't exist anymore. It does. One of the trends right now at weddings is, is couples writing their, their own vows. And that's actually kind of a good thing because it's better than just saying I do, you know, but there's also a downside to people writing their own vows, and it's this. Many times they're leaving out God. The more wedding vows that I hear people writing, they're leaving out God. Many of the vows that I've heard are really more like a kind of a high school, social, junior high social contract. I will love you as long as the sun shines. Well, what happens when it rains tomorrow? Do you get a divorce then? You know? I will love you because you make me feel great. Well, what happens when they're in the hospital and they can't make you feel great? I love you because you're so beautiful. Well, listen, I hate to tell you, but she's going to lose her look someday, and guys, you already have, okay? So... <laughs> Listen, don't get too many elbows going. All right. <laughs> Listen, that's I love you if. I love you if. That is conditional love. That's not a love that makes a marriage last. So a lot of contracts today in marriage really sound like a 36-month lease for a car. It's like, I love you as long as we both shall love. Really? I love you until debt, debt to us part or divorce to us part. And part. They're leaving out God. The first thing about marriage is that God created it, and he created it for the connection of man and a woman for life. Number two, God created marriage for the multiplication of the human race. God created marriage for the multiplication of the human race. It's how we all got here. You're sitting here because a couple got together and made you. This was God's idea. This God populated the planet through marriage. For thousands of years, billions of people have come into existence, men and women, and because men and women got married. And God says, this is part of my plan. Let me give you a little background on this. The Bible says that God is what? Love, right? God is love. It's his character. It's his nature. If God was not a loving God, you would not have any love in your life. You wouldn't be able to experience and feel love. There would be no love in the universe. The only reason you are able to love is because you, as a man or as a woman, were created in God's image. Squirrels don't love because they weren't made in God's image. Worms don't love because they weren't made in God's image. Ants don't love because they weren't made in God's image. You get the point? But men and women have the capacity to love because we were made in God's image. And God said, I want to love. I want to share my love with others. And I want to express my love. So he created the universe so, he, so that he could create the human race, so that he could love us, knowing that some of us would choose to love him back. And then we would live for, with him forever and ever in heaven. Think about this. God chose everybody who's going to be in heaven to come into existence through marriage and sex. That's the way he chose. Nobody would be in heaven if God hadn't created marriage clear back in Genesis, the creation of the world, because everybody is coming into existence 
through the tool that he designed. Let me show you some verses. Genesis 1, 27 says this. So God created people in his own image. He patterned them after himself, creating both male and female with his image. Then God blessed them and commanded them. So here is the very first command. This is back in Genesis 1, 27. Here's the very first command that God gives to the human race. And I want you to read it with me. We're going to, and so God commanded them and it says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Wow. So God's first command to the human race is get married and have sex. That, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is the only command of God the human race has been able to consistently keep. <laughs> We've done a good job with that one. I'm glad you're laughing. I was starting to wonder. Listen, there are 7 billion people on the planet because your parents and their parents and their parents' parents were fruitful and multiplied and filled the land and filled the world. The point is, God says, one of the purposes of marriage is for the multiplication of the human race. It's not the only purpose, but it's a big one. Look at the next verse, Malachi 2.15. This is a message paraphrase. God, not you, made marriage. His spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. And what does he want from marriage? He's very clear. He wants godly children from that union. Because if people, why? Because if people don't have kids, then we're, if people don't, sorry, I lost my place. If people don't have kids, then there aren't people to go to heaven. There aren't people for God to bestow his love on. So he wants godly children from that union. So he says, so guard the spirit of marriage within you. Now listen, this passage isn't an indictment for, for couples who can't have children, couples who don't have kids. There are couples who want kids, and for whatever reason, they can't have them, or they've been unable to have them. Listen, if you're married and you can't have kids, God is not disappointed in you. And I have people sometimes tell me, I feel like a failure because I know that I should be having kids, but I, but I can't. God's not disappointed in you. There are other options that are just as important and just as valuable, like fostering children and adopting children, like many people in our congregation have done. And it's just as important because they're training those children up in the way that they should go so that they will someday spend eternity with Christ as well. So God is not disappointed. That's not what this verse is saying here. So don't, don't read it the wrong way. What it's saying is that we're all alive because some couple got together. For thousands of years, God has used marriage to populate heaven. And if men and women weren't getting together and marrying and being fruitful and multiplying, there would be nobody in heaven. There's a second reason. The second purpose, uh, uh, that's, that's the second reason, the second purpose of marriage. Number three on your outline. God created marriage for the protection of children. God created marriage for the protection of children. We all know that kids grow and that they grow better, they grow healthier, they grow stronger when they grow up in a stable family, when they grow up in a marriage with a mom and a dad. Why did God create marriage for the protection of children? Because when you were born, you were completely helpless, right? When you were born, you couldn't do anything for yourself. You couldn't feed yourself. You couldn't dress yourself. You couldn't change your diaper. You couldn't blow your nose. You couldn't even turn over on your back without some assistance. God knew that human children needed a safe environment. And you were going to need somebody to feed you and dress you and, and train you and guide you. Let me give you a summary of 150 studies on the impact of marriage, negative or positive, on children. Studies have shown that if children grow up with two parents without a mom and a dad, there's increased risk that they're going to fail in school. Kids without two parents are more likely to not graduate from college. Kids without two parents are more likely to be involved in substance or alcohol abuse. They're more likely to experience dis distress, depression, and the risk of suicide. They're more likely to do jail time. They're more likely to live their entire lives in poverty. And they're more likely to increase the risk that they themselves will divorce or bear children outside of marriage. Can this be overcome? Of course it can. Can children from single-parent homes still succeed? Of course they can, all by the grace of God. I know some awesome single moms. 
I know some awesome single dads, and they work tirelessly to surround their kids with great people and great influences. These studies just show how much greater the challenge is when one of the parents is missing, and it only further highlights the importance of marriage as defined and created by God. Statistics also show, on the other hand, that children who live with their own two parents growing up will enjoy better physical health than children living in any other family form. I didn't say this. This is just what 150 or so studies have shown. How about women? Studies show that women who marry and stay married have lower rates of depression than either single women or mothers cohabitating with a guy that they're not married to. Women who marry and stay married have a lower risk of being a victim of crime. They have a lower risk of violence in their life. Women who marry and stay married have a higher net worth than those who are living with a man they're not married to. That's interesting, isn't it? How about men? Studies have shown that men who marry and stay married earn more money than single men with sim similar education and job histories. And men who marry and stay married live longer than single men. There's a good reason to get married. Your wife keeps you alive, clearly. See? Men who marry and stay married, uh, stay married amass more net worth than those who live with a woman not being married to them. And men who marry and stay married have fewer injuries and illnesses. What's that saying? It's just saying something, it's just saying something really simple. When you do it God's way, it works out better in your life. Doesn't work out perfect. Don't leave here today and say, well, pastor said we're married. It should be perfect. It should, no, that's not what it's saying. But when you do it God's way, it works out better in your life. Every single study done has proven that kids develop best with a mom and a dad in the home. But listen, we're on a broken planet, right? Not everything works right. We know that. But that doesn't mean that the ideal isn't real. It is. And the statistics bear it out. Children survive and thrive in families, not institutions, not in contractual agreements. Notice this verse, Proverbs 14, 26. Very important verse. Those who obey and respect the Lord, in other words, th those who do life the way that God says to do it, those who obey and respect the Lord have a what? Secure fortress. Their children have a place of refuge and security. Those who obey and respect the Lord. Some of us know what the Lord expects. We just aren't doing it. And then we wonder why we have this insecurity. We wonder why our children are growing up insecure. But when you obey and do as the Lord has instructed, you have a secure fortress. Their children have a place of refuge and security. That's what every child needs growing up, a place of refuge and security. And not worrying, well, is dad going to walk out or is mom going to walk out or whatever. In the past, you used to hear about couples, and they'd say they stayed together for the sake of the children. For many generations, when people stayed together for the sake of the kids, that was actually considered an honor. That was considered a compliment. They're unselfish. They're mature. They stayed together for the sake of the kids, and those kids actually turned out all right. But today, in our narcissistic culture, we judge everything by, you know what? I've got to do what's best for me. No, you don't. In fact, you will never be happy trying to always do what is best for you. Never. So God created marriage for the connection of men and women, for the multiplication of the human race, for the protection of children. Number four, God created marriage for the perfection of our character. God created marriage for the perfection of our character. It's in relationships that we learn to be unselfish. We learn to be loving, and no relationship has a greater impact on your life than marriage. Another one of the facts about when you were born, not only were you helpless, you were completely self-centered. Nothing, nothing on planet Earth, Earth is more self-centered than a baby. A baby doesn't even have the capacity to think about anyone else. All it can think about is itself. You know what I'm talking about if you've had kids. I'm too hot. I'm too cold. I'm hungry. I need, I need a clean diaper. Whatever it is, the first word out of a baby's mouth is I. Mine. I. It's selfish, right? And it's all about me as a baby. Maturity and the purpose of life is to grow up and to realize that, listen, it's not all about you. In fact, real happiness, true happiness comes in giving your life away and being unselfish and being serving and being loving. 
So the whole goal of your life is to grow from your totally self-centered self as a baby to being an unselfish adult. The hurricanes gave you a perfect opportunity to, to, to flesh this out and actually understand. The people who went out and served, they came to me and said, Pastor, I, I, I want to go serve more people. I feel like I'm getting more out of helping others than just looking out for myself. Well, duh. That's how God created it. We weren't created to be selfish and look out for number one. We were created to serve others just as Jesus came to serve and not be served. Do you know some adults who are still selfish babies? Yes, you do. Don't look at them right now, but you know who they are, right? That's called maturity. The Bible says, Proverbs 18, 1, it's selfish and stupid to only think of yourself. It is selfish and stupid to think only of yourself. So how do I get out of that? Listen, marriage is a lifelong course in learning to be unselfish. All the guys said? Amen. Okay. Because once I get married, I can no longer just think about me. I can't just think about me, myself, and I. How many of you who are married had to learn pretty quick, quickly that once you got married, you couldn't always just do whatever you wanted to do? How many? Right? Yeah, okay. The rest of you are liars. Okay. <laughs> Five people raise their hands. Listen, you can't always just do what you want because you don't, you just, you don't get to do that anymore. You have somebody else that you have to consider. You have somebody else that you have to think of. You've got to learn to compromise. You've got to learn to think of that other person. And marriage is the laboratory for learning how to love. Listen, God wants to make you like Jesus Christ. That's the number one goal for your life. God's number one goal for your, your life is for you to become more like Christ. He wants you to grow up. He wants you to build character. You're not, taking, you're not taking your car, your career, your clothes to heaven. You're not taking any of that stuff with you to heaven. You are taking your character to heaven with you. So the most important thing that you can do in your life is to build character, to become like Christ. We call that sanctification. The number one tool that God uses in your life to build Christ-like character, if you are married, is your spouse. Some of you say, oh no, <laughs> yes, yes, it's your spouse. Because every day you get hundreds of opportunities to not think about you. You get opportunities to think of the other person, to care about them, to show them love and respect, and to, to meet their needs. You say, but my spouse or my husband or my wife isn't even a Christian they're not a follower of Jesus. They're not a believer. It doesn't matter. They're still God's number one tool to make you like Christ because they're the closest ones to you and they have the most impact on your life. Write this down in your outline. The number one purpose of marriage is to make me holy, not happy. The number one purpose of marriage is to make me holy, not happy. That is so counterculture, but it's the absolute truth. Here's the interesting thing. Once you become holy, that's how you get happiness. Being holy makes you happy. Now listen, being holy doesn't mean that you won't ever slip up. It doesn't mean that you won't ever say something you shouldn't have said, but it beco means becoming more like Christ each and every day. Moving forward, not backwards. Progressing instead of regressing. So the number one purpose in marriage is to make me holy, not happy. Here's the interesting thing. Everybody's out there seeking happiness. Everybody's out there searching for happiness. And God says, you know what? If you'll just come in and get in a relationship with me and allow me to make you holy, you'll find that happiness that you are so longingly trying to find. God's purpose in your life is to make you holy, not happy. And that's the purpose of God for marriage in your life is that you become more loving and more giving and more serving and more sharing and more mature and more unselfish. Because when you start caring about other people rather than your happiness, you're going to get happy too. For those who served during the hurricane and helped other people, did you not find that you were the happiest you've been in quite some time helping other people? That's what people kept telling me. I found that to be true as well. It's just the way that God wired the universe. So God wants us to learn how to love in marriage. Romans 12 says this, Love sincerely. Hold on to what is good. Be devoted to each other like a loving family. Excel in showing respect for each other. Do you do that in your marriage? 
Do you have a competition each day to see who can show the most respect to the other person? Well, I'm going to beat you today of being more respectful to you, or I'm going to beat you in, in being more loving. Excel in showing respect to each other. That's what this verse is saying. Out of that kind of love comes a connection and, and a companionship that gives you strength and the stability to handle enormous amounts of stress and enormous challenges in your life. God made marriage for the connection of men and women. He made it for the multiplication of the human race, for the protection of children, for the perfection of our character, and number five, for the construction of our society. Marriage is the fundamental building block of every community. It's the fundamental building block of every church and state and nation and society and culture. If you know anything about history, you know that where marriages are strong, cultures and nations are strong. Empires are strong. Think about that in the context of the United States, and you do your own evaluation right now. You know that whatever, wherever marriages and families are weak, cultures and nations are in decline pretty obvious what direction our nation is headed right now, is it not? America is not getting better. It's not getting stronger. It's going the other direction. Why? Because we don't value marriage anymore. We don't value family anymore. We value, you know what? It's all about me. I've got to do what's best for me. We've, we've made individualism an idol in our country. So it's for the construction of society. Proverbs 14, 34 says this, righteousness, that's called doing it God's way, okay? Righteousness lifts up a nation, but sin, that's not doing it God's way, brings disgrace to any society. Righteousness lift up, lifts up a nation, but sin brings disgrace to any society. Number six, this is the most important reason of all. And many of you have never even heard this reason maybe for marriage, but it's the primary, deepest, most profound reason that God created marriage between a man and a woman, the unity of sex and all that that involves. God created marriage for the reflection of our union with Christ. God created marriage for the reflection of our union with Christ. Marriage is a symbol. It's a walking, living object lesson of how much God loves us and how we are to be in relationship with Him. Marriage is a model of of a profound spiritual truth. It's a metaphor of showing us how we are to relate to God, the one who created us. Let me show you one of the deepest passages in Scripture. Paul is actually talking, he's, in this passage, he's talking about the church and Christ, but he uses marriage as a metaphor in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Well, how did Christ love the church? He sacrificed his life, right? He died for the church. Christ sacrificed. He laid down his life. He died for the church. And so he's saying, husbands, that's the way you're to love your wife. You're to die for your wife. That's the kind of love that you're to have. Sacrificial love. So husbands, love your wives the way that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He, Christ, died so that he could give the church to himself as a bride in all her beauty. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they love their own bodies. No one ever hates his own body, but feeds and takes care of it. We're going to go out and feed and take care of our body after service. And that is what Christ does for his church, his body. So the church is a bride. The church is a body. The scripture says, and he's quoting that verse in Genesis that we just looked at. The scripture says, a man is united with his wife and the two become one body. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church, Paul says. I thought you were talking about marriage here. What, what's he talking about? He's talking uh, husbands and wives. No, he says, I'm using marriage. Paul says, I'm using marriage. It's a metaphor of our spiritual union with Christ and his love for his family and his body and his bride and the church. So he goes on to say, each husband must love his wife as much as he loves himself. Each, must, each husband must love his wife as he loves himself, and each wife must respect her husband. We could preach a whole message just on that passage. There are some benefits of marriage that are obvious and quantifiable. Like these, what it does for kids, what it does for women, what it does for men. We talked about those earlier. The benefits of an intact marriage for life are irrefutable. There are a lot of benefits to marriage that you can just look at em empirically judging the scientific data. But this one, the most profound meaning 
of marriage is not as easy to grasp. It's harder to understand and appreciate how marriage reflects our union with Christ and our relationship with him. Listen, no other relationship on planet Earth, none, including the parent-child relationship, no other relationship can adequately illustrate our union with Christ the way that marriage between a man and a woman does. This is the strongest reason, number six, why marriage matters. This is the strongest re reason why marriage cannot be redefined. It's the strongest reason why it must be protected at all costs because we are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ in union with Christ. And marriage is a metaphor. It's that metaphor. So let me summarize what I'm saying here. It really doesn't matter what other people think about marriage. It doesn't matter what public opinion says about marriage. It doesn't matter what opinion polls say about marriage. It doesn't matter what's politically correct or incorrect and in, in what people say about marriage. What really matters is what God says because he's the one that invented marriage in the first place. And you're living in a culture where that is absolutely counterculture. You now live in a culture that has forgotten why marriage matters. You live in a culture that doesn't honor it, but actually demeans it and discourages it and ridicules it and redefines it and dismisses it as irrelevant. And as a result, we can see what's happening in society. We now have people who go to Las Vegas and they get drunk and get married spontaneously and 24 hours later they get a divorce like it's nothing. It's just a social contract. We have celebrities who spend a full year and millions and millions of dollars on a wedding, and the preparation for the wedding lasts longer than the marriage does. <laughs> we have people going from one relationship to the next to the next in serial marriages. They don't understand the meaning of marriage. And what's amazing about all this is that we live in a culture that has forgotten why marriage matters. We still honor, even though we live in a culture that's forgotten why marriage still doesn't matter, why marriage matters, I can't talk, why marriage matters, we still honor that. We actually still make big news out of that. When a couple makes it 50 or 60 years or 70 years sometimes, what does it do? It shows up on TV, right? So-and-so celebrated 60 years or 70 years together. Why? Because in spite of all the public and political pressure, we instinctively, as human beings, inside, we know and we recognize the beauty and the sweetness of one man and one woman committing themselves to become one flesh and living together for the rest of their lives. It's a beautiful thing, and internally, we know it. We know that deep down inside of us, instinctively, we are wired to want this. Everybody craves safety, of a, the safety of a relationship where you're so fully known and, and known by each other and it lasts for a lifetime that it's a safe place for you to be. Everybody wants that. So as I wrap this up this morning, let me say this. Twice in the Bible, Jesus says there's going to be no marriage in heaven. So why all the conversation about marriage here on earth? Why no marriage in heaven? Jesus said it twice. Because you won't need any of these six reasons that marriage exists. In a perfect place, heaven, in a perfect place, you're not going to need the multiplication of the human race. In a perfect place, you're not going to need the perfection or the protection of children. You're not going to need the perfection of your character once you reach heaven. You're not going to need the construction of society. You're not going to need the reflection of Christ's union once you're there in heaven, living as the bride of Christ with him. You won't need a metaphor because you're going to experience the real thing in heaven. But here on earth, marriage matters. And the Bible says we're to honor it. The Bible says we're to honor marriage. Whether we've ever been married or we're married or we lost a mate or whatever, we're to honor marriage. And when we do, our children will face a better future. When we honor marriage, we'll grow in character. We'll have a stronger and more secure society with a bright future. And others will be able to see our union with Christ through us and the example that we set for them. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for this time together in your word. Lord, some conversations are harder than others to have, but we know that all of your word is inspired by you and written by you and useful and profitable for teaching. So Lord, we thank you this morning for marriage. God, we thank you that you created it. We're a place for men and women to connect in holy union with you so that they might discover their true happiness as they grow holy first. Lord Jesus, we thank you that in those relationships we can find protection and safety and security. And Lord,
Lord, I know that some have gone through difficult relationships where they may have been through a difficult divorce or they, they may have lost a spouse or it, it may not have ended well. But Lord, we know that your grace is sufficient to meet our needs. We know that there's forgiveness where mistakes have been made or things haven't worked out and that, that your grace can bring us through those difficult times, Lord Jesus. But regardless of the past, Lord, we know that we're still to honor marriage as you've defined it. And so I pray, Lord Jesus, that as we begin this series on building stronger marriages, as we talk about building stronger relationships and raising our children and growing a stronger relationship with you, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to approach it with open minds to hear exactly what it is that you would have for us to hear, that you would help us to take what we've heard today and that you would speak to us through the words that, that have been shared from your word, and that you would speak to our hearts and convict us where necessary, Lord Jesus, and, and help us to grow stronger in areas where maybe we're weak. Our children and our grandchildren and the families that are struggling. Watch over them and protect them this week. Thank you for our friends and family who have joined us today, Lord Jesus. And I pray for the food that we're about to eat, that you would bless it to our bodies, that you would help us to use that food for energy, for, for furthering your kingdom, for your glory, for your honor. Lord, bless this time of fellowship that we're about to have. And thank you for this precious time in your word this morning. In Jesus' precious name and all God's people said.